Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. It is true that Peter himself told the Jewish people in no uncertain terms that they too had been guilty of slaying the Son of God, Acts 2.23. Was, was Peter really speaking only with a view uh, to attaching the blame and responsibility to the Jewish people for an act of wickedness, which was indeed a slaying in the sense that this was what they intended it to be? You know, just like the man who's adulterous in his heart is condemned as an adulterer in the sight of God, Matthew 5.28, and just as David, by contrast, who in his heart greatly desired to build the Lord's temple, was credited with having built it, 1 Kings 8, 18. So this murderous intent was quite properly called murder. Peter was therefore justified in accusing them of slaying our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet we know from other scriptures that Jesus was not slain at all by the Jewish people. He said plainly that no man takes his life from him. John 10, chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our Lord's death. It's a very solemn subject. One I think you may find enlightening. You'll probably hear me talk about things that you already know. But maybe I can sort of magnify this a bit and make it interesting for you to follow. The Lord's death was the Lord's doing. It was in no sense, no way was it a suicide. Yet he said plainly that no man takes his life from him. It wasn't a martyrdom, as many people would like to think. Paul suffered martyrdom, as most of the apostles did. But Scripture is very specific in distinguishing between the martyrdom which Paul anticipated and the death of our Lord. Paul spoke of himself as ready to be offered. That's uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6. But of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is said rather that He offered Himself, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. Paul's death was passive in the, in the sense that although he was undoubtedly willing and even anxious to go on into the Lord's presence, nevertheless, his life was taken from him by man. The Lord's life was not taken by man as he himself said. It was important that Christ offer himself. You know, consider, just consider what happened once a year when a sacrificial victim was offered on behalf of the nation. Basically, the essential feature uh, was the transfer of Israel's guilt to an innocent victim which was then ritually sacrificed. Its blood, the symbol of life, was taken by the high priest into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God, and was there sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant which contained the tables of law representing God's standard of holiness. Before offering the sacrificed victim, it was first examined and it was approved as being without spot and flawless since the slightest defect could not possibly escape the scrutiny of God whose immediate judgment would then have fallen upon the high priest had he dared to enter God's presence with such an unacceptable offering. So the offering had to therefore be first declared entirely free of all defect and without fault and then made accountable for the sins of the people by 
imputation, a guilt transferred by the ceremonial laying on of hands of the high priest. When the high priest returned once again from the Holy of Holies into the presence of the other officiating priests, all the people of Jerusalem were publicly informed of his safe return from this awesome ceremony, therefore signaling the acceptance of Israel's sacrifice by God Himself. And then further trumpet blasts carried the glad news across the whole land. The people were once more accepted and safe in the presence of God until the time came for the renewal of the sacrifice again at the next great Day of Atonement. There's no question that the spiritually discerning in, in Israel, those who had their eyes open, saw in this ceremony something far more significant than the mere sacrifice of an animal. They believed that one day God would provide for Himself a sin offering who would redeem men by taking upon Himself the iniquity of us all, exactly as the goat of the Old Testament ceremony bore the iniquity of Israel. This was what was in John the Baptist's mind when he received the call to prepare the way for the coming Messiah, whether he fully understood that the Messiah and the promised Lamb were one and the same person is not absolutely clear. In one place, at least, he seems to have had some doubts asking whether the Lamb was indeed the same person as the Messiah. After his imprisonment, he sent word to Jesus saying, in effect, art thou the promised Messiah? Or do we look for another person? It's important to remember that John had no doubt in his mind as to the identity of Jesus as the Lamb of God at the very beginning of his ministry when he went down to Jordan and began to call the nation to repentance. He was like many in Israel, quite certain that the time had finally come for the appearance of a Redeemer. As each individual came to him to be baptized, he must have scrutinized them with great care and concern, and evidently God gave him a sign that would allow him to identify the Lamb of God among all those who were flocking to Him. So, one day he suddenly recognized the one whom God had chosen, and he cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God. John 1, 29. But that recognition did not at the same time assure John that Jesus was also the promised King. John did, however, know that this King, when He appeared, would do wonderful things as Isaiah foretold. This is why Jesus answered him in Matthew 11 as He did, drawing specific attention to the precise way in which He was fulfilling these messianic promises. He did not rebuke John for lack of faith. He merely gave him assurance. And so the Lamb of God had come, remembering that this Lamb had first to be proven without fault before the priestly judges and then to be declared guilty by the same court which must have seemed an impossibility. It is wonderful to see how precisely the requirement was fulfilled in Jesus' trial. Let's look at His innocence. In Mark chapter 14, we have a picture of the trial of Jesus. He's led away to the high priest, which was precisely what was done with the Lamb for the atonement sacrifice of the Old Testament. In verse 55, the people of Mark 14, the people who spoke for Israel, the chief priests and, and all the council sought for witness against Jesus and found none. This is, again is precisely what happened to the Lamb in the Old Testament. The Lamb was scrutinized intensively. But in this case, having no genuine fault that could be pointed to, they had to seek false witnesses. For many bore false witness against Him, but their witness agreed not together. <clears throat> so in effect, He was tried and He was proven innocent. But then He was asked a crucial, a crucial question. The high priest says to Him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And of course He said He was. And at this point, 
we have the strange anomaly of an innocent man being declared guilty for stating a truth. This truth was not acceptable to the court because the court itself was so terribly guilty and so they condemned him to death. You know, any one of a number of deaths were possible for a condemned man under Roman law. They could have, they could have killed him in many, many different ways. That, that they would choose crucifixion was no accident since it was one form of capital punishment whereby a man was not merely put to death but was also accursed in the sight of God, Galatians 3.13. In other words, they forced upon Jesus, who was innocent, not merely the condemnation of the court, but the, condemna condemn the condemnation of God Almighty Himself as well, also. Since this form of judgment couldn't be carried out by the Jewish authorities under Roman law, they had to appeal to Pontius Pilate. And in the second judgment which followed, the innocence of Jesus was once again established. Pontius Pilate, I find no fault in this man, John 18. It seems that Pilate, speaking for the Roman authorities, was really a spokesman for the civilized world since he was the representative of a world empire. Pilate didn't just announce his judgment once, but three times. In John 19.4, he said, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. In Matthew 27, he said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Mankind passed judgment upon the Lamb of God as innocent and then surrendered Him to be destroyed as a criminal. Now consider what all this really means. It means that an individual who had done, done nothing in secret, who had for three years probably been the most talked about public figure in all of Judea, who had been constantly approached in devious ways by trained legal minds to trap him into some error of judgment who had been misunderstood by his friends and family and was often weary to the bone, could without hesitation turn to his worst enemies and ask, which of you convinces me of sin? And no one had anything to say. I'm sure you've heard that, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, but not so with our Lord. He was absolutely without corruption, though He had all power committed to Him. Pilate's wife warned her husband against compromising himself when she said in Matthew 27, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? One of the thieves on the cross, in spite of his agony and in pending death, rebuked his fellow sufferer, saying in Luke 23, This man hath done nothing amiss. And then we have the Roman centurion, who was apparently in charge of the detail of soldiers, given the responsibility of, of making sure that the crucifixion was carried out properly. And after watching the Lord on the cross for some hours, was overcome with a sense of conviction and said, and we read it in Luke 23, certainly this was a righteous man. Judas himself knew that he had made a tragic mistake. Matthew 27, 4, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 said he knew no sin. Peter wrote, in chapter 2, verse 22, 1 Peter 2, 2, 2, that he, he did no sin. John said, stated in 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, in him is no sin. And the writer of the epistle of the Hebrews, whoever he might have been, added his testimony with the words, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. Never was such a cumulative testimony given towards establishing the total innocence of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So overwhelming was the evidence in the end that the Jewish authorities admitted indirectly that they too had made a great mistake. Matthew 27, 64. So there's no question at all that the Lamb was without blemish and without spot by the judgment of mankind, the judgment of Jew and Gentile alike, and this requirement having been fulfilled perfectly, He was then condemned to be put to death and not merely to die as one unworthy to live, but to die accursed of God because of the very form of capital punishment which was demanded for Him as it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree Galatians 3.13. But here's where we enter into a great mystery. For, you know, whereas as we've already seen, Paul spoke of himself as ready to be offered of, of Jesus, it is said that he offered himself. In other words, he was brought as a lamb to be slaughtered, Isaiah 53. But when the time came to die, he assumed the position of both high priest and lamb at one and the same time, Hebrews 7.27. In John 19.16, we were told that Pilate delivered him up to the Jewish authorities to be put to death, but in John 19.30, we're told that he delivered up his spirit into his father's keeping. In both passages, the verb is the same, the Greek being paradidomai, which means to hand over without compulsion as an act of free will and by a personal decision. In these two verses, we have the lamb delivered to be slaughtered, but the same lamb making the offering himself entirely of his own will. The four Gospels record the, the moment of death very simply. In Matthew 27, 50, it's written, Jesus, when He had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Mark records, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Mark 15, 37. Luke, he's a little more explicit. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Thy hands I commend My Spirit. And having said this, He gave up the ghost. Luke 23, 46. In John 19, 30, we have these words. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. And He bowed His head and literally dismissed His Spirit. I've always been particularly impressed with with the carefulness with which those who produced the authorized version in 1611 sought to render the original with prayerful precision. The death of Jesus was different from that of any other man. No one could take his life from him except as he was willing to permit it, John 10, 18, and Christ chose to die so that you and I might live. I count 15 passages of Scripture in which a single Hebrew or Greek word is used which means to breathe out or to expire and which is rendered by uh, some such phrase as gave up the ghost. Scripture is singling out the Lord's death as being unique in the sense that He deliberately dismissed His Spirit as an act of will. I'm absolutely certain that this is what the Lord did. God, who is the source of life, could not simply be slain by the will of man. Jesus, in the time of His own choosing, dismissed His own spirit without any form of compulsion except that He willed to do it. I think it's worth repeating again that in John 19, we are told that Pilate delivered up Jesus to be crucified and this first handing over corresponds to the phrase in Isaiah 53, He is brought as a, as a lamb to the slaughter. From Jesus' point of view, He was the passive object in this transaction, but this was as far as man could go. The second handing over came when Jesus, as an active agent, offered Himself acting as both, as both the priest and sacrifice. In death, man is humbled. And as Ecclesiastes chapter 8 points out, he has no power to resist or change the course of events when that time comes. But Jesus claimed that he himself did have the power to lay down his life, John 10. And accordingly, it was he who humbled himself, Philippians chapter 2, 
We are humbled so that death for us is something which we suffer passively. He humbled himself so that death for him was something which he embraced actively. He differed from us in that he became obedient. Philippians 2.8, not being constitutionally subject to death, but rather being made after the power of an endless life. Hebrews chapter 7, that is immortal and not under the necessity of dying. Don't think that all Jesus ever meant when he spoke of the fact that no one would take his life from him was simply that he would not be put to death until he was ready, until his time was come, that he would to put it in slightly different terms, submit to them to put him to death only when he was completely ready to do so. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't just think that all Jesus really claimed was his right and power to choose the time of his death. I believe he, he did indeed have the power to choose the time of his death. And many scriptures in the New Testament show clearly that until that time came, his enemies were prevented from taking any fatal action against him. But surely this was only part of the truth. The truth, folks, is much more profound than this. The fact is that because he was virgin born, he was not subject to natural death at any time. And because he was God having life in himself, he need never have died even on the cross. He had the power to sustain life indefinitely, even under these circumstances, had he wished to do so. And equally important, he had the power to shorten his life if he wanted to, so that he need not have endured the shame of the cross for more than a moment if it had not been an essential part of his work in man's redemption. The fact is that the crucifixion is a form of capital punishment provided a unique setting in which under condemnation of man and under the curse of God, the Lord Jesus could endure the agony of being made sin for us entirely without compulsion and entirely as an act of His own free will. In some way, after an eternity of spiritual torment, of which we can have no conception whatever, and during which time meaningless ticked over a period of three hours, clocks, they didn't have clocks back then. Maybe they had some form of a clock, I don't know. But the judgment of God upon the wickedness of man as assumed vicariously by the Lord Jesus Christ suddenly ended and with it the supernatural darkness. The God who had forsaken him in judgment reestablished his fellowship with his son and the utter loneliness of that eternity of separation was followed by such an overwhelming sense of restored communion that Jesus cried out in a loud voice of victorious exultation, It is finished. And having thus finished the work for which the cross was essential, it was now po possible for all of his agonies to be ended, both physical and spiritual. And turning his face toward heaven, and long before the natural time for such an event and such a circumstance, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit, commend my spirit. And then he dismissed his life, there being nothing further to be accomplished on the cross. He died by an act of will, a sheer and unique triumph of the spirit over the body. It's surely the fact that he was raised without seeing corruption. That was the final proof of our justification for this equally unique historical fact demonstrated that his death was in no way due to the element of corruption that in our bodies renders us mortals and our death the inevitable end of life. In him, there was no such corruption to accelerate the processes of decay and death which so afflicts our senses when it occurs. I do not believe that the cause of Jesus' death was a broken heart, nor do I believe that Jesus exercised His will only in the sense of choosing the time when He would submit to the de designs of His enemies. I'm not persuaded that when the time came, Jesus merely allowed some circumstance circumstance to affect his death. His death was entirely an act of will, the same will that now governs over our lives. Christ, when crucified, spontaneously dismissed the Spirit with a few short words. The one who had the power of laying down his life laid it down when he chose. The, this astonished the centurion who said, surely this was the Son of God. When the centurion heard him saying, 
to his father, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, and perceived that he immediately dismissed his spirit of his own free will. He was struck with the greatness of the miracle and acknowledged him to be truly the Son of God. You know, it seems so easy to find parallels to what the Lord did when for our sakes He laid down His life on the cross. History superficially presents us with numerous similar examples of noble self-sacrifice. Men in war sacrifice themselves for one another or for their loved ones. Almost every day someone gives his or her life to save someone else. In what way then was our Lord's death so unique? How was this sacrifice entirely unlike any other? Jesus was not entirely deserted by His friends at the moment of His death, whereas many men have died alone as martyrs without anyone to mourn their passing and without any comfort in the knowledge that, that those especially dear to them would be cared for. Nor had He suffered more physically than than. Other men have suffered like those who, for example, deliberately chose to be crucified upside down like Peter or, or were crucified only after enduring disembowelment. There's no doubt that there are more cruel deaths than crucifixion. I think the uniqueness of Calvary lies in two circumstances, the first being spiritual. In writing to the Corinthians, Paul said, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in the original, the, uh, Paul uses a Greek word poieo, which has the basic meaning do or create. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, Paul is stating that in some way the Lord Jesus on the cross as the Lamb of God and during those hours of darkness when He was under judgment was actually made to be the author and the cause of sin. He somehow became identified with and held responsible for everything that, that is ugly and wicked and hateful and cruel and spiteful, utterly abhorrent to God. In short, everything that man has been or done or planned to do as a sinner, it's not as though he was merely blamed for what had gone wrong, though undoubtedly this is part of the judgment of God. For God laid upon him the iniquity of, of us all. He did not merely assume responsibility. He in effect became identified with the very wickedness itself, the reason I am innocent in God's sight is that He actually assumed my guilt. When was the last time you felt guilt? <clears throat> Listen, folks, the, the identification, the priestly ritual of establishing identity in which the sins of a whole people were somehow laid upon an innocent creature had to be completed before the victim was slain. Let that sink in. The, the victim's time was not come until that absolute identity had been established. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. So all this had been symbolic, foreshadowing what was to happen in due time when God provided Himself a lamb. This lamb, unlike the victim of the atonement, was not merely a passive participant that could have no possible consciousness of what was to be the outcome of the ritual, but he was, he was one who knew from the beginning of his public ministry, and even much earlier than that, what this outcome was going to be. His agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. It stemmed from this foreknowledge. The Lord Jesus must have known with fearful certainty that the cross was to be a stage, a setting, a, an occasion, a time in which the judgment of God would exalt itself, exhaust itself upon Him in which the righteousness of God would be preserved and forgiveness given to those who were His. We can have no idea of what it meant to the Lord who had never harbored a sinful thought nor ever committed a sinful act to wait, as it were, on the cross in anticipation of the sudden falling of the judgment of God which was to come upon his soul, the turning away of his father as he condemned him for the wickedness of man and judged him to be its cause. He must have known in those first three hours that at any moment that blow would fall Death would have been a merciful intervention, something infinitely to be preferred 
if by it the eternity of judgment could have been evaded. He had the power to dismiss his spirit and to terminate that part of his ministry in which he identified himself with man, but he did not do that. But after the eternity of judgment and separation was over, when God had said, in effect, it's enough, when the light burst forth once more and the relationship between the Father and the Son was restored again, then the Lord cried out in triumph. He cried out, it is finished. And then in the very nature of the circumstances, the physical burden of crucifixion made itself felt once more and He cried out, I thirst. But there was no need now for the Lord to sustain life any longer. His work was done and in one single gesture which demonstrated His complete dominion over life itself, He sent away His Spirit, committing it into His Father's hands. Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has gone astray in His way. And the Lord gave Himself up for our sins. In Galatians, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself, that is, delivered Himself up for me. The second unique aspect of the Lord's death lies in the fact that He died on the cross, but not because of it. He chose not merely the time to die, but He chose dying when He need never have died at all. He died actively, not passively. He was not humbled in death as we are, but He humbled, he humbled Himself. He, he was not offered as the Lamb was offered by someone else, but He offered Himself. He, he didn't surrender to the tyranny of death, but He embraced it. He died with a ruptured heart, but not because of it. He was not by nature subject to the law of natural death as we are, as man now is, but rather he became obedient unto death. His death did not indicate the final triumph of flesh over spirit, but of spirit over flesh. In short, he did not yield up his spirit as man is called upon to do, but rather dismissed his spirit voluntarily at one and the same moment, committing his spirit into the Father's hands and passing out of the confines of incarnation into an entirely new level of existence made finally and fully complete with the resurrection and the glorification of His body. Such then was how, was, this is the how of the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then He rises from the dead. And then He calls you to Himself through His Word, which you heard and will hear without a doubt if you are His. We here at Blessed Hope Forever love you dearly. Rest in Him as that glorious day of our Lord's return, as, as that day draws more closer. Please pray for the direction of this ministry. I ask for you to please, please pray for all of the victims, all of those who are suffering through one of the greatest storms in the modern era, Helena. And, and please don't look at that as a natural event. There's nothing natural about it. Look, until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.